Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. How's Hi, it Casey. So today's podcast is about a book. We're having our first book review. It was a book club. Right. Matthews suggested a book called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and we read it, and I thought we should do a podcast about this. This is uh, nothing new in this book. Everything in this book, I feel like everyone should know. We have many clients who have probably practiced everything in this book, and that's why they are uh, where they are today. But I think we forget. We forget what's working against us in this, um, in this world and, and our thoughts on, on money. I found that my key takeaway was really it's slow and steady wins the race. And there's so many things that work against us when we're saving. And one of those is uh, we think in the here and now. We think what's happening right now will always continue. And we assume what's happening now has always been, right? But that's not the case at all. You know, we think back to the concept of retiring, right? wasn't that long ago you didn't retire. You worked until you killed over, I guess, or got too sick to work, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, Social Security didn't even begin until the 1930s, and it was a generation or two after that where it began to really seep into the the society, into the economy, where people could begin to think about and then actually retire at age 65. I mean, through the 1960s, we still had 40% of the people working beyond that age. Okay. Today, it's around 20% of the people who are working beyond that age. I mean, the desire for people to want to retire at age 65 or near age 65 has just grown exponentially over the years. The 401k didn't exist until 78. The Roth IRA didn't exist until 1998. That's right. I mean, even when they did retire, they were able to live off Social Security, and, and most employees had pensions back then. So you know, you had an income source coming in, so there wasn't as much of a need to to save and learn those behaviors as much. And over the years, 401k balances or really defined contribution balances has grown into the trillions. The last estimate was somewhere between eight and ten trillion dollars are in these account balances for people to begin drawing down on in order to support themselves in retirement. And then you add on top of that defined benefit plans for people who still do have pensions. And the number in, in you know the economy is somewhere around $35, $36 trillion of retirement assets waiting to be spent down. We have, um, you know, I often talk with young people about, about money and saving money. And, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a few guarantees, uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and compounding. <laughs> the eighth wonder of the world. Yes. So uh, he talks about compounding in the book uh, for a few chapters. Uh, one of those I thought was an interesting tidbit on Warren Buffett. Yeah. So the, you mentioned compounding. Uh, Warren Buffett's net worth uh, at the time that Morgan wrote this book was $84.5 billion. Uh, 84.2 of that he actually accumulated after his 50th birthday. And 81.5% uh, five of that came after his mid-60s. So most of what you see on TV and his net worth has come later in his life, but it's because he started saving early on. Um, he actually started working when he was 10 years old, and by his 30s, he actually had a net worth of a million dollars, or $9.3 million adjusted for inflation. Obviously, a lot of people can't start working when they're 10, and they can't accumulate that kind of wealth early on, but it just shows you the scale of how he grew that million to the, the $84 billion just by investing early on and uh, continuing to invest and letting it compound. So by age 65, he was well-established as a billionaire, Right. But he continued to work and amass a great deal more than that. Right. They're saying, you know, if he started in his 30s, which most people can now, he still would have had significant wealth. He wouldn't have been the uh, one of the world's richest men, but uh, he still would have had a, a net worth that he could have lived off of. Kind of goes back to the basic principle, too, of you see where somebody retires or somebody's contributing their 401k at age 25 to 35. They actually have more money than if they contributed age 35 up until they retire at 65. So getting a head start on it and, and really letting compound turns work for you really benefits you. So that that's time. So time helps, obviously. We see that all the time, but people come in and ask for retirement planning and they're uh, 55 years old and they haven't saved a whole lot at that point. They have to put a lot of money away 
uh, in, in order to retire by even 70, where if you start in your even your 30s, you're it's so much of an advantage because you have that time for compounding. It takes less dollars to get more dollars in the future. But what I, what I found, what I also found interesting was it's not just uh, the compounding, but also how, obviously how you invest. So go back to, he has a re reference to um, the Russell 3000. So out of the Russell 3000, uh, it has increased 73 fold since 1980. So 73 fold since 1980. That, that's a really good rate of return, right? 40% of those companies failed in that index during that time period, 40%. So if you think about that, there's 7% uh, of those components performed extremely well, enough to offset all those losses of the 40%. So if you're trying to pick stocks or you have a mutual fund manager who's picking stocks, this is, this is a, a very good case for indexing, buying the index, buying the group, right? Because you're gonna have the, the Apples and the Googles, right? or the alphabets that, and Microsoft that are exceeding, that are bringing up the averages. We're seeing that exactly right now in the S&P 500, where we're watching, what, 32% now uh, of the S&P is in tech. Right. Where now oil, which 10 years ago was a huge portion of the S&P, is now dwindled down to under 5%. Yeah, under 5%. Easy, it's around 2% or so. Yeah. I mean, it's just become such a smaller part of the economy. And by investing in the index, you're just allowing the natural ebb and flow of the economy to um, watch capital flow towards where it's going to get the best the best return. So, and then we think about time as well. Um, you think about GDP growth over the history of our nation from 1850, around four dollars per person, to now the chart stops in 2010, but as roughly around ninety dollars a person in 2010. Think about all the things that have that have happened. Over that time span, he references 1.3 million Americans died while fighting in nine major wars. Roughly 99% of all companies were created when out of business. 99.9% .9 of companies since 1850 have gone out of business. Four U.S. presidents were assassinated. 675,000 Americans died in a single year from a flu pandemic. 30 separate national disasters uh, killed at least 400 Americans. 33 recessions lasted 48 years uh, in total. The number of forecasters who predicted any of those recessions rounds to zero. <laughs> the stock market fell more than 10% from a high at least 102 times. Stocks lost a third of their value at least 12 times. Annual inflation exceeded 7% in two, 20 separate years. The words economic pessimism uh, appeared in newspapers at least 29,000 times, according to a Google search. All that negativity, and what have the markets done over that time period? Generally, they've gone up and up and up. It's a straight-up chart. And even if you look at it on a year-by-year -year basis, there's still more positive years than negative years. Well, the one thing that's constant, as they say, is change. And just listening to the statistics that this book has put out, change has occurred throughout our history, and yet... The ability to adapt to that change is what makes successful investors and successful business people. And it gives us the opportunity to accumulate wealth over time. Okay? Now, if that changes, everything that we've talked about, that we're talking about today, must also have changed. So even money has changed. Currencies have changed over time. You know, we had coins, and then moving to paper currency. There's barter. There's gold. Yeah, they were going away from the physical gold to, to money, uh, actual fiat currency. And now we've got the Bitcoins be becoming a big thing. It's not even a physical currency to touch. So, um, you know, that, that could be something 50 years from now we look back and, and have a different conversation on that as well. Completely. Absolutely right. He talks about investing in a recession. And there's a whole section on, on pessimism in the market. And I want to cover that too. But investing during a recession can be scary, uh, much like uh, we had a a brief recession recently, <laughs> the fastest into and the fastest out of. So yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just pull from one of his chapters. Investing uh, during recession is, is scary. So perhaps you invest a dollar in the stock market when the economy is not a recession, sell everything when it's 
in a recession and save your, your monthly contribution in cash or and invest everything back in the stock market when the recession ends. That's what people uh, want to do. Probably they look at it in hindsight and it looks easy. In the moment, it, it's very difficult, low, very low probability of success in doing that. But we call that investor gym. Perhaps a few months of a recession to scare you out, then it takes a while to regain confidence before you put money back into the market. You're, you're going to invest in stocks when there's no recession. So you sell six months after the recession begins and get back in six months after the recession ends. We'll call you Tom. And then uh, Sue just kept investing the entire time. So Jim right, tries the time to get out before and don't invest, put money in cash, buys at the end. Jim buys, is in a recession, sells six months in, then six months later purchases. Uh, who has more money? you know, hands down, it's, it's Sue. There were 1,428 months between 19, 1900 and, and uh, 2019, just over 300 of them were during a recession. So Sue ends up with 435,000, Jim has 257 and Tom has 234. Yeah. She kept her cool and she's got almost three, three fourths uh, more, more money than them just from continually dollar cost averaging into the accounts. Just 22% of the time, the economy was in recession. Right. I think it just reinforces something that, you know, we talked about Warren Buffett a minute ago. What he said about the only way to make money in the stock market is to be invested in the bottom. You have to be invested when the market's at its bottom. And that way, you're assured to get these upswings as well, that you don't miss any part of the, the upward movement in the stock prices. Easier said than done. A lot of that goes back to just basic fundamentals of investing and, and behaviors. You know, a lot of what this book covers is not going into any special investing techniques or any algorithms and, and analyst work, but really just simple blocking, tackling fundamentals of just the psychology of, of investing and controlling those behaviors. There's so many things that run against you when you're trying to do that, though. Oh, in today's consumerism economy, there are so many things out there that are vying for our dollars. We're so few dollars, yet there are so many things that want them. Goods and services, who wants the new car? Who wants, <laughs> who wants to, you know, move up to that new house? Who wants the vacation home? Who wants the boat? Who wants the motorcycle? Who wants the new toys? We all do. They're all vying for our dollars, including our future selves are vying for our dollars because when we put a dollar away for retirement, we're actually paying for a future self. And so that self is vying for those dollars too. Yeah, but also too, I think there's obviously fear. Oh, yeah. People are fearing. Uh, well, we have it during the election. You know, people are fearing a Biden win, um, and now they're still fearful. But the reality is, is that the president of the United States has little effect on, on the stock market overall. Now, you could say that maybe Obama policies, things were, uh, uh, we had stagnation in the market during that time period. Um, however, uh, we also are coming out of a really nasty uh, financial crisis too at the beginning of his presidency. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I don't, uh, if, if you read the headlines, you know, your references in the book, um, if you say there's a market correction coming or there's a market crash coming, you get more attention in the media than if you said, hey, it's going to be smooth sailing for these next 10 years. <laughs> right? So you have to realize where, where you're, where, if it's a newsletter that you're paying for, if it's uh, a TV show, you have to realize where the revenue comes from. If you're watching TV, they get paid by viewership, right? The more viewership they have, the more they can charge for ads. And so when that happens, um, uh, you have to understand they're selling you something too. Right. There's a, there's a lot of noise out there. And two quotes I really liked were things that never happened before happen all the time. And history is made uh, mostly of the study of surprising events. So you know, there's a lot of hindsight bias here where they say they, they they're, I guess they're going for that. They, they get this uh, predicted something that, that wasn't going to happen, but really it's just a lot of noise out there. One distinction he makes is uh, rich versus wealthy. You know, I think in the vernacular, most people think the two are the same, but they're really not. Someone could be rich and live lavishly, but still not be wealthy. Someone could be wealthy and live pretty normal and appear not to be rich. Another book that was written out there by a person here in the Atlanta area uh, wrote a book called uh, 
the millionaire next door, where a lot of wealth is in the house next door. You just don't know it because they don't live lavishly and rich. Right. You don't see their balance sheet and what kind of wealth they built. But, um, you know, you also don't know that those people that are rich are, are wealthy. Um, a lot of times, you know, it is that millionaire next door. They've just found a way to live within their means, invest and save, and that's made them wealthy. Uh, and you mentioned it too. What does wealth actually get achieved for you? Um, I think you had mentioned it before. It was, it was that your time. You actually are able to... And when you ask a lot of people this, the, the common answer that the book brings out is that it controls, it gives us the ability to control our time going forward and then how we spend that time. So then time becomes a currency that we pay for with money. That being said, it, it gives you the opportunity to use your money in such a way that benefits you greatly. Interesting, you know, going back to Warren Buffett, because he's such a, a well-known figure, even at age 65, he had billions of dollars, but his time, he felt, was better spent continuing to work and continuing to accumulate. He didn't just quit. His time was doing exactly what he controlled. His, he controlled his time by doing exactly what he wanted to do. So his definition and use of money is very different from somebody who says, you know what? I've been working for X number of years. I want to go do something else with my time and they come to a financial planning firm such as ours and say, how can you get me to that point in my life and financially that I can retire and then essentially control my time? What's, what's interesting, or I guess another takeaway I got was stay in your lane. You know, so many times that we, we start looking at what other people are doing, but we don't have the full picture. Uh, he, he references as people are playing different games as well. Uh, with investing. I thought that was interesting too, Casey. I really did. Um, and then once you actually see it, what, what I think that this author did is he put these concepts down on paper that had been floating around, at least in my head, and it absolutely clarified it. This is one that I think became very clear, is that investors are out there playing different games that, that others may not be aware of. So you have short-term right. trades, you have day trading, mm -hmm. you have people who might be in for a month or two, and then you have people like our clients that are more focused long term, right? And yeah. and, and and sometimes, uh, as as all of our mothers probably told us, there's nothing for free. There, everything has a cost, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That, that that free lunch at the or that free dinner at the steak restaurant, they're trying to sell you an expensive annuity, right? <laughs> <laughs> so everything everything has a cost. The cost of investing long term is at times volatility, it's extreme volatility. volatility. But you have to take those, take those days, weeks, or months, or maybe a year, and you have to then focus on what is my end goal? What's my game? My game is to be here long term because the S&P, the uh, foreign index, the bond index, over an extreme long time, 10 plus years, which is, I guess, not, it's not really extreme, but 10 plus years, those asset classes have never lost money. So that, that's what you have to be focused on is building portfolios with long-term healthy asset classes and keeping your cost low. And, and that's part of that, that recipe. He has a chapter on, uh, specifically about how he invests. And that, that, that comes out. He, he has the same investment philosophy as, as, as we do, essentially. So when you're playing the, the long game, the question then becomes, is the market priced or valued right for me now? So it depends on what game you're playing, right? So if you're playing the long game, and as you mentioned, asset classes have gone up over 10 years, then the valuations currently are fairly valued. If you're playing the short game and you see the market high or it's stock price high, you may be concerned about whether or not it's going to remain high because the price you're going to pay as an investor is volatility. So you may be concerned about pricing at valuations at, at any given time. You just mentioned valuations. He talks about uh, Benjamin Graham's uh, Intelligent Investor probably one of the most popular uh, investing books that's been around. And each year it's continually uh, redone. 
and they asked him right before he passed away, you know, if anything he had was relevant that he'd written in there. And he said almost no, because that continual investing philosophies and in, in the world around him with technology and everything has changed. So that these simple philosophies are you're not the same. Everything's going to be evolving. So, you know, you have to really focus on, on having a broad look at things and being diversified. Question we get often right now is, uh, what do I do with my savings? My savings doesn't pay me anything. And I always tell people, well, your savings is not supposed to pay you anything. It's, it's great if you can keep up with inflation in a very safe environment, FDIC insured being the safe environment. He supported that. Having enough money in savings gives you uh, freedom. So you lose your job and you have the ability to wait it out. We have a, we have a client now that was uh, let go, uh, airline shut down, but he has a considerable amount of savings. And he says, I'm not looking to go to some carrier where I'm gone 16 days out of the month flying leftover parts to Iran. Uh, that doesn't interest me. I'm going to wait for the market, my domestic carriers to rebound and then apply. His savings is a little excessive, um, but in a good way, you know, he can probably go four years, maybe longer without having to um, go find a job as a Walmart greeter or something like that. But that, that's the important part. You're, it's okay if your savings pays zero, yet savings is there to create maybe opportunity. So if he waits for the right job at the right, at the right airline with the right retirement benefits, that, that savings uh, is actually not yielding him zero. It's, it's, it's a huge return. Or maybe it's a business owner. Maybe you lost your job and you're going to start your own company or using that as seed money for the first two or three years. And then your company does really well. How much, what was the rate of return on that savings? Huge, right? So, so building savings and having reserve is, is, is an important part. And it's okay that it pays zero. It's, it's that safety margin. You know, we even do that in the financial plans. We have a safety margin that's set aside and not included in the plan. Uh, we try to increase the probability of the plan, but that's that's there just just in case. Yeah, absolutely. So in summary, uh, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, you can find it at Amazon.com. Uh, it's a great, great book. Uh, I, it just the chapters are, are very easy to read. And I think in the end, uh, it's a great reminder that we have forces working against us. Uh, sometimes it's what we see with our eyes. Uh, sometimes it's... Um, anxiety of, of losing. No one ever wants to lose, right? Uh, and it's keeping a focus uh, long term. But building wealth is, for most people, is a slow and steady process. It's a mindset. Yeah, it, it has less to do with the income and, and your returns and just more with your savings rate and just controlling those behaviors and focusing on the long term. Here's all, these are all great things that we'll continue to um, remind clients about as we walk them through setting their own goals and processes for building their own wealth. All right. Good conversation, guys. As always, we'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thank you. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.